Wir haben heute einen sehr, sehr hochkarätigen Interviewpartner, nämlich Rick Ruhl. Rick Ruhl, wer ihn nicht kennt, ist ein ja, Milliardeninvestor, wenn man so will. Man kennt ihn im Prinzip im Rohstoffsektor. Jeder kennt seinen Namen, denn er gehört zu den Top-Investoren, zu einem derjenigen, der wirklich auch viele, viel, viel Geld in diesem Sektor gemacht hat und äh, ja auch viele Firmen unterstützt hat. Ähm, es würde jetzt viel zu lange dauern, seine ganzen Positionen durchzugehen, aber äh, wer ihn nicht kennt, sollte sich unbedingt mal mit ihm befassen. Ich habe euch ja immer gesagt, unser Netzwerk geht tief. Ihr bekommt hier einen ganz kurzen Einschnitt, worüber über wir heute sprechen und dann melde ich mich gleich noch mal. Uh, as an American, I'm very flattered. You guys send us cars and steel and computers and we send you back pieces of paper with dreams printed on them. From my point of view, this is a hell of a trade and it's very flattering, but why do you do this? The gold stocks will run again. They will. You have to be a contrarian or you are going to be a victim. The investors who do the work now and act on it before the gold run The equivalent of the investors who invested in gold stocks in 1971, before the market found out about them uh, in 1974 and 1976, are going to be the people who make money. I own gold because I'm actually afraid, afraid, that in US dollar terms, the gold price is going to go to $7,000 or $8,000. Ihr seht also, wir haben sowohl sehr spannende Themen als aber auch ähm, natürlich einen englischen Interviewpartner. Das ganze Interview, wir machen jetzt hier kleine Parts, ja, um das ein bisschen verständlicher rüberzubringen. Das ganze Interview ist auf unserem englischen YouTube-Kanal zu finden. Da ist Axino Capital, Connecting Investors and Companies. Und wir werden in dem heutigen Video, falls ihr im Englischen nicht ganz so gut seid, ich finde, der Rick spricht sehr langsam, sehr gut, gibt es die Funktion, sich Untertitel einblenden zu lassen. Dafür klickt ihr hier einmal auf dieses kleine Ding, damit die Untertitel aktiviert sind, geht auf das Zahnrädchen Einstellungen, habt hier die Option Untertitel und dort könnt ihr nochmal in die Unteroption gehen und da hat man aus Englisch automatisch erzeugt, das macht YouTube meistens und dann werden wir entsprechend noch einen deutschen Untertitel hinzufügen, der sinngemäß das mal auf Deutsch wiedergibt, was der Rick sagt. Ja, bitte nicht auf 1 zu 1 Genauigkeit, aber einfach um ja, jemand, der der englischen Sprache nicht ganz so mächtig ist, trotzdem das Ganze zu ermöglichen. Wir gehen tief rein, viel Spaß mit dem Interview. Zunächst wollte ich von Rick wissen, warum er Gold besitzt. Er könnte sich ja alle Anlagen äh, im Prinzip kaufen, aber was macht für ihn Gold so interessant? Und da fand ich seine Antwort sehr interessant. Well, I, I, uh, from a US point of view, uh, the gold price moves because people are concerned about the maintenance of purchasing power in fiat instruments in the US, the US savings bond, you know, the US savings, uh, US treasury securities. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that Americans understand yet the level of deterioration in purchasing power that they're experiencing. Uh, I, I'm not addressing this part of the talk at Germans so much as helping the Germans understand the American problem, which is important to gold. Americans' perception of inflation uh, is geared around something called the Consumer Price Index, the CPI. And the CPI would have Americans believe that their purchasing power is declining by about 2.8% compounded. But the CPI isn't a measure of the deterioration of the purchasing power. It's an index that's created by, if you will, the big thinkers, <laughs> by the Angela Merkels of the world. Uh, it's hedonistically adjusted, uh, which means it's manipulated. Uh, it also doesn't include tax. The idea that a cost of living index didn't include the component that's the most important component in the living cost for American families is farcical. I believe myself that uh, the purchasing power of the basket of goods and services that I consume suggest that the purchasing power of my savings is declining at about 7% compounded. If you own a US 10-year treasury paying you 4.2 in a currency where your purchasing power is declining at 7% compounded, what it means is that you're losing 2.8% a year. You can do that for a while. I go back again to 1967 when inflation really reared its ugly head in the United States. But Americans didn't notice the impact of inflation until 1974, after the gas price at the pump had more than doubled. 
after the price of food had doubled, after the price of rents had doubled. During the decade of the 1970s, the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar fell by 80%. Not surprisingly, the gold price soared. As more Americans come to recognize the deterioration of the purchasing power of their savings held in conventional U.S. dollar denominated savings instruments, my belief is that gold inevitably will do well. Gold will need to lead then the gold stocks will follow. It's important to remember that there's historical precedent for this. You know, the writing was on the wall in the U.S. in 1967. Nobody gave a damn until 1974. When they began to give a damn, the lid came off the thing. I don't own gold, uh, Jan, because I believe that the gold price in U.S. dollar terms is going to go from 2000 to 2200 or 2500 I couldn't care less. That's Mm -hmm. background noise to me. I own it because I remember the decade of the 70s when the gold price ran 30-fold. I remember the decade 2000 to 2010 where the gold price ran seven-fold. I own gold because I'm actually afraid, afraid that in U.S. dollar terms, the gold price is going to go to $7,000 or $8,000. Afraid because that will be an expression of trouble. And I'm 71 years of age. Uh, I'm happy. I'm rich. I don't want to experience trouble. Uh, I just believe that I need to insure myself for the contingency that that trouble will find me. That's why I own gold. Rick sagt also ganz klar, die Vergangenheit hat schon gezeigt, dass es einfach Krisen gibt, häufig auch inflationäre Phasen, in denen sich der Goldpreis durchaus auch verX-fachen kann. Ja, und man glaubt es ja immer nicht so, dass sich der Goldpreis mal wirklich stark nach oben äh, bewegen kann. Es gab aber schon Phasen in der Historie, da haben wir Verx-Fachungen im Goldpreis gesehen. Und Rick sagt, er hat eben Angst, dass wir diese Verx-Fachungen im Goldpreis wiedersehen. Er sagt, es kann durchaus noch mal auf 7.000 oder 8.000 US-Dollar hochgehen. Und dann würde sich eben zeigen, was für Schwierigkeiten, Probleme wir im Finanzsystem haben. Dass das passiert, ist nicht unbedingt ausgeschlossen. Das finde ich sehr spannend, aber dann habe ich natürlich auch auf der anderen Seite gesagt, okay Rick, jetzt ging der Goldpreis ja schon stark nach oben. Wir wollen aber natürlich wissen, wann die Goldminenaktien hinterherziehen. Die Frage habe ich ihm auch gestellt und das war auch wieder seine Antwort. Three answers to that. Mm -hmm. First of all, if you look at history, in the period of the 1970s, you saw the gold price advance for four years before you saw the gold stocks advance. I think that's important to note. Uh, Many people are impatient and think that as a consequence of an increased gold price, we should see uh, increased gold share prices, and we will, but we won't see see it soon. Uh, The second thing is that the author of the poor regard that investors have for the gold mining industry is the gold mining industry. There have been sins (laughs) in that industry. Uh, If you look back as an example to the period 2000 to 2010, the gold price in U.S. dollar terms moved from $250 to over $1,900, a seven-fold increase. And the free cash flow per share of the XAU declined. It took real management skill to turn a seven-fold increase in the selling price of the product into declining free cash flow per share. Yeah, And the industry has begun to, but needs to continue to reform itself. I would suggest to you that investors bear most of the blame. When investors think about gold stocks, they think about the decade of the 70s, the most explosive up period in, in the history of gold mining stocks. And so they look for companies that exhibit leverage to the price of gold. Ironically, it's the marginal companies the companies that have the lowest profit margins, that have the highest cost, that exhibit the best margin increases when the gold price increases. So investors have been taught and in 50 years have looked at the market for leverage, which is to say they've searched out marginal companies. This is pathologically stupid. Uh, We need to look at mining companies that are good businesses. And we need to look at the increase in gold price as icing on the cake. I would go so far as to say, if you invest in the sector, the sector itself, senior gold miners or junior mining companies, you will over two decades go broke. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is 
look at the whole sector and look at the 5% of the best issuers in that sector, because despite the very poor corporate performance of the sector, uh, individual companies have generated so much performance that they've added uh, legitimacy and including and occasionally luster to a sector which has for 50 years been a serial underperformer. Mm -hmm. Now, the gold stocks will run again. They will. Uh, it will take time. Most investors won't have the courage to buy the stocks before the run. Most investors will, because of their greed, after the stocks have run, buy them, which is to say uh, it will be the price performance that justifies the gold stock narrative. To make money in resources, which are capital intensive cyclical businesses, you have to be a contrarian or you are going to be a victim. The investors who do the work now uh, and come to understand which are the better companies, not just the marginal ones that have the most leverage to gold, and act on it before the gold run, the equivalent of the investors who invested in gold stocks in 1971, before the market found out about them uh, in 1974 and 1976, are going to be the people who make money. <laughs> after the gold price has really run, and after the gold stocks have really run, which I believe is going to happen, most of the people will become involved in the late stages of the market, and inevitably those people will lose money. Zu guter Letzt finde ich es noch sehr interessant, dass wir uns mal dieses Thema Ost gegen West angucken. Ja, und äh, hier finde ich, hat Rick eine sehr interessante Sichtweise. Und zwar sagt er auch, das werdet ihr gleich in seiner Antwort hören, äh, es gibt eigentlich keine Freunde unter Staaten. Staaten haben Leader und diese Leader haben verschiedene Interessen. Und diese Interessen, die der Osten hat und die Interessen, die der Westen hat, die passen ganz offensichtlich nicht mehr zusammen. Ich finde es aber auch sehr spannend, was er gleich in seiner Antwort sagt, wenn es darum geht, ob der US-Dollar langsam aber sicher verschwinden wird. Und auch hat Rick uns Insights gegeben, als er nämlich noch in seiner aktiven Zeit, als er Investmentprodukte verkauft hat, ähm, auch im asiatischen Raum war und dort mal die Banker und Investoren, die Großinvestorin gefragt hat, warum sie denn auf Dollar setzen. Ähm, und er sinngemäß die Antwort äh, bekommen hat, naja, äh, wir haben keine andere Wahl. Also das ist jetzt auch nochmal ein sehr spannender Teil. Ähm, unbedingt auch den nochmal anschauen. Yes, there will be a huge change. You asked me a whole bunch of questions there. I'll try to remember them as best a 71-year-old can. The conflict between the East and the West, uh, let's start that. I think there's less and less differentiation between the East and the West. Uh, I think that, that trying to define as an example the United States as a non-statist, even non-fascist economy is wrong. Uh, I don't believe that countries have friends. I believe that their leaders and their elites have interest. A and there seems to be conflict uh, between the so-called Eastern leaders, be they Russian, be they Chinese, be they Iranian, and the Western leaders. Um, The multipolarization that I see is probably a good thing. I don't think with 8 billion people, there is one answer. I think there's 8 billion answers. And my preference, rather than having 150 sovereigns, would be for there to be 8 billion sovereigns. But nobody asked me, really, uh, how I want to see things working out. But my hope is that we continue to talk to each other. Uh, the idea that we decide, we, meaning the Americans, or, or NATO, decide to vilify the Russians, irrespective of how reprehensible we feel their policies may be in certain circumstances, that we need to continue to talk, uh, that we need to find common ground, that we need to find a way not to kill each other, that we need to find a way uh, to back away from the threat of nuclear contact. When the Russians make the point that with the dismantling or the so-called dismantling of the Iron Curtain, and particularly around the reunification of Germany, that NATO made specific promises to the Russians uh, about the eastward expansion or the lack of eastward expansion of NATO, and then reneged on those problems in six months, those promises in six months. The idea that the entire responsibility for the conflict in Ukraine rests on Russia is perhaps faulty. Mm -hmm. uh, we suggest to the Russians and the Russians suggest to the West that both interfered in the political processes in Ukraine. And they're both right. <laughs> or depending on your point of view, they're yeah. both wrong. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not engaging in this discussion to talk to you about right or wrong. I'm, discuss, I'm discussing the fact that there is some legitimacy to both points of view. And we need to continue to talk and we need to find a way not to fight. Uh, we need to understand that each has interests. <laughs> and at least from each side's point of view, their interests are legitimate. We need to find a way to find some common ground. That traditionally, I think, has been through trade. Uh, and I find sanctions probably very counterproductive, counterproductive two ways, counterproductive morally, because we need to engage more, uh, counterproductive practically too. Uh, let's look at the sanctions around Russia and uranium or the sanctions around Russia at all. During the period of sanctions, Russian exports of uranium to the United States doubled. <laughs> uh, and if they didn't double, if we banned Russian uranium, Russian uranium would simply go to India or China. And Australian and Canadian uranium that went to India and China would come to the United States. <laughs> this is all fairly simple stuff. And I think we need to view it uh, like that. Now, with regards to the U.S. dollar, uh, the second part of your question, I think. Uh, yeah. My friend Doug Casey famously calls the U.S. dollar the prettiest mare at the slaughterhouse, uh, which is to say that despite widespread predictions of the dollar's decline, the dollar has gotten a little bit stronger every year for many, many, many years. It is not, I assure you, as an American, because of the continued dominance of the world economy by the United States. Rather, it's because the race to the bottom uh, is one where other countries are beating the United States. As self-destructive as we are, we seem to be less self-destructive than other people. When you look at a replacement for the U.S. dollar, you, you need to look at a replacement for an economy that has 23% of the world's savings and investment assets. For the next 20 years, it can't be done. You need to look for capital markets that are as transparent uh, as the U.S. with free convertibility of the currency and absolute transparency with regards to the statement of accounts. Can't be done. Uh, you need to find uh, a currency with the liquidity of the U.S. Treasury market and the U.S. dollar. Can't be done. What I found when I was selling in my active career before my so-called retirement, when I was selling investment products to sovereign wealth funds, and the biggest investors in the world, uh, in particular in Asia, uh, I, I would go and I would see that U.S. Treasuries were an important part uh, of their financial holdings. And I, and I sort of said after I got to know these people, so listen, uh, as an American, I'm very flattered. You guys send us cars and steel and computers, and we send you back pieces of paper with dreams printed on them. From my point of view, this is a hell of a trade, and it's very flattering, but why do you do this? Uh, I mean, it, it, it seemed to me almost like we're selling you lies, uh, given our current account. And I remember very well uh, one of my counterparties looking at me and smiling and saying, Mr. Rule, what you say is, of course, in the long term true, but your lies are deep and liquid lies. They're the best lies that we're told. <clears throat> and the consequence of that is that we own U.S. Treasuries because we don't have a second choice. In this conversation, I followed up by saying, do you trust us? And my counterpart said, oh, no, but we trust you more than we trust each other. Uh, Doug Casey, again, famously said, the U.S. dollar is an I owe you nothing. The euro, by contrast, is a who owes you nothing. Uh, and the BRICS, uh, given the lack of transparency uh, and the lack of solvency, are uh, nobody owes you anything. One of the reasons I think that you've seen an increase in the gold price uh, has to do with foreign central bank buying. The foreign central banks are buying an asset that doesn't have a current yield because they understand that it's a store of wealth and a medium of exchange that doesn't require any trust in the counterparty. They've learned because of the weaponization of the U.S. dollar, both through the confiscation of $300 billion of U.S. treasuries held by the Russians, but more specifically through the U.S. control of the SWIFT banking system, that despite the fact that they want to do business in U.S. dollars and can't do business in U.S. dollars, uh, that the only reasonable medium of exchange and store of value at their level is gold. At the end of the day, 
the Russians, pardon me, the Chinese don't want to end up with 20 billion rubles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How can they spend them? What does Russia produce that China needs other than, say, natural gas and iron? Uh, and the Brazilians uh, don't want to end up with a couple billion remnimbi. Uh, the only medium of exchange that the world has right now, which has the liquidity and the transparency, is the U.S. dollar. And that will change only very, very, very slowly. By the way, the enemy of the U.S. dollar is not China. It's not Russia. It's not Iran. The enemy of the U.S. dollar is the U.S. Congress. The only people who could wreck a franchise as great as the U.S. dollar is the U.S. government. Ja, ich hoffe, diese Insights und auch das Interview hier, dieser Part mit Rick Rule hat euch gefallen. Wie gesagt, wir versuchen das hier ein bisschen in zwei Teile aufzudröseln. Er hat aber noch viel mehr gesagt. Wir haben über 40 Minuten gesprochen. Das ganze Interview, wie gesagt, ist auf dem englischen YouTube-Kanal zu finden. Abonniert den gerne. Auch dort werden wir häufiger solche Interviews hochladen. Wir versuchen es ein bisschen aufzusplitten. Ja, rein englische Videos auf einem Kanal, auf Deutsch das Ganze ein bisschen aufzuarbeiten. Ich hoffe, das Ganze gefällt euch so. Ich hoffe auch, dass ihr gerade aktuell schöne Ostern habt und dann freue ich mich, wenn wir uns in den nächsten Tagen hier auf dem YouTube-Kanal wiedersehen. Schreibt mir gerne mal in die Kommentare, ob ihr ja, dieses Format gut findet, diese englischen Videos so ein bisschen aufzudröseln, ob ich das mit den Untertiteln geholfen hat. Ich freue mich und ja, verabschiede mich bis zum nächsten Video.